be given um, an experimental talk uh, where we're trying to study the interfaces between ultra thin complex oxides. And our interest here is to try and understand magnetic um, and electronic interactions which take place at these interfaces. All right, and so my, uh, a lot of this work has been done by my PhD student, Sana Skupa, who has been working on growing these materials and characterizing them using a wide range of techniques. And um, the work I'm going to share today has been done in collaboration with um, Alexander Dijoscu at the Fatahang Institute, who's provided us with some very good theoretical um, support. All right, so the material I'm going to be talking about are the transition metal and um, perovskite um, oxides. And in this material, um, they have this basic uh, perovskite structure where you have a transition metal ion surrounded by an octahedra of oxygen. And at these sites here, you can have either group one or group two or the lanthanides occupying these sites here. And the important um, point here is that we can obtain very different um, physical properties by either changing the transition metal ion in the structure or the doping at these sites here, or even changing the structure by um, creating very small um, perturbations to the um, cubic um, high symmetry case. And so I'm going to be focusing on the um, lanthanum stronger manganite uh, material where we have manganese as a transition metal ion. And at this site here, which I'm going to refer to as an A site, we can dope holes by changing the concentration, relative concentration of lanthanum and strontium, where increasing the strontium content increases the hole concentration in these um, compounds. And that um, a very special doping of about 30% uh, at room temperature and below, this material is in a ferromagnetic metallic um, ground state. So my talk today is going to focus on dimensionality as a parameter by which we can tune the properties of these systems. And so what I'm going to talk about is how we can go from lanthanum strontium manganite, which is well understood in bulk and well characterized, and reduce its dimensions in a thin film form to the order of a unit cell of this material. And what we'd like to do is understand how it, these properties change and how the interface between, uh, how it also couples to other materials which are grown um, to form interfaces with these ultra thin systems. And so my talk today is going to focus on how, very briefly on how we grow these materials and how we characterize them using a wide range of um, techniques. Uh, we use bulk um, squid magnetometry to try and uh, determine the magnetic um, moments of these um, systems as we reduce the dimensionality. And we also use synchrotron X-ray diffraction, which I'll describe, to determine to very high uh, precision the atomic scale structures of these ultra thin systems, which I'm going to show is also very um, important in trying to understand the functional properties. And then all of this is also combined with high resolution microscopy and theory. Um, and um, the focus today is going to be on specifically on trying to understand how, why in these, many of these oxide systems, there, there are physical properties which are strongly dependent on the thicknesses of these um, systems. And so in the case of lanthanum um, strontium manganite, there's a very strong coupling between the lattice structure and the magnetic properties and um, transport properties due to the fact that um, there's a super exchange which takes place between the transition metal D orbitals, which are um, strongly directional, the bridging oxy oxygen P orbitals, and then the next um, neighboring um, transition metal D orbital. And so what we can do to tune the properties of these materials from an experimental point of view to tune bandwidth and to tune hopping and to tune the super exchange magnetic interactions is that we can distort, we can, we can go these materials in ways by which we can distort these of the hydra, either by causing them to rotate more or less in their bulk um, um, structures, or we can apply compressive or tensile strain to um, um, change the distances between these um, oxygens and the transition metal ions. And the whole um, effect is that we can engineer the, um, the physical properties by um, these um, tuning parameters. And um, additionally, if we're able to make multi-layers of these materials where we grow very thin films, then we can create interfaces here where the coupling of that interface can also lead to changes in the um, orbital overlaps between the relevant um, orbitals in these systems. Uh, the other um, way we can tune the properties of these materials in these layered structures is by trying to um, change the um, interface and polarity. And so one example of where the um, growing two materials with different um, polarities can lead to interesting properties is the case of um, lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate, where if you go a lanthanum aluminate film along the zero zero, zero at the 100 direction on the strontium titanate substrate, 
Um, if you're considering the ionic limits, the charges of the, the ions in the system, you can see that in the strontium titanate, you have neutral strontium oxide, titanium and dioxide planes, whereas in the case of the lanthanum aluminate, you have um, layers in the ionic limit which are alternating positive one, minus one charges. And in these systems, at this interface, due to this polar discontinuity, and if you were to make this film thicker and thicker, there's going to be a divergent uh, potential which the system would like to relax by um, a couple of mechanisms which include charge transfer to this interface or some intermixing across this interface or even changes to the atomic scale structure where the um, ions can polarize in response to this um, interfacial discontinuity. And the reason this is interesting is that in this particular case, you have these two materials which are band insulators, lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate, but you end up with an interface driven by these reconstructions, which is which has um, a high mobility two-dimensional electron gas, which shows signs of uh, ferromagnetism and also superconductivity. So what we like to do is um, use this concept of um, trying to um, manipulate the interface polarity to manip also manipulate the structure and functionality of these complex oxide materials. And again, I'm going to focus on the magnetic transitions which have been observed in lanthanum strontium manganite thin films. All right, so the, the bulk wave manganites um, are very well, uh, well, I, I've, I've, been, I've studied for a very long time. And this is a plot of the phase diagram where, um, as a function of the strontium doping or the whole doping, uh, you can stabilize very different um, magnetic and um, electronic phases. And so, for example, if you start from lanthanum manganite and you increase the strontium doping at about 30%, uh, the ground state is a ferromagnetic uh, metallic state. And if you were to go up in temperature at about 350 Kelvin, you go from being a ferromagnetic metal to being a paramagnetic um, metal for lanthanum strontium manganite. Um, you can also change the bandwidth of the system by replacing strontium with calcium. And in that case, the high temperature phase here is a paramagnetic insulating um, phase. Um, and so in these systems, due to the crystal field splitting, you end up with the 3D uh, manganese orbital splitting into and the T2G um, orbitals down here, and the, in the case of manganese 3 plus, it is a G4 uh, system, um, and EG orbital here, in, which is singly occupied. And you can break this um, degeneracy by um, applying it by, through the antenna distortions of, by applying um, a epitaxial strain. And so, for example, if you were to go this material and you were to apply by bi biaxial in plane um, comp um, compressive strain, um, the octahedra elongates along the z axis. And what that does is that it lowers the energy of the 3z minus r square orbital which points out of plane. Those get occupied and the um, x square minus y square orbital which points in plane is um, unoccupied. And so in this material, you have all these degrees of freedom you can manipulate if you can grow them in very thin film form. All right, so we're growing this material using molecular beam epitaxy over at our lab at um, NC State University. And so we have a system by which we're able to grow these um, thin films with atomic scale precision. And so we can grow layers um, going from half a unit cell to tens and hundreds of unit cells with um, really good um, crystal quality and very good precision. And if we were to grow a very thick film, so a thick, here yeah, I'm referring to 30 unit cells, which is um, on the order of um, 10 to 12 uh, nanometers thick. This is a plot of the magnetization as a function of temperature. And um, it's very clear that this material here has um, uh, a transition from being paramagnetic to being ferromagnetic at about 330 Kelvin. And the saturation magnetization here we get for these very thick samples are very close to what you expect for bulk like um, LSMO. Um, but if we were to reduce the film thickness of the order of three unit cells, you can see that the magnetization goes down by a very uh, large amount. And even at very low temperatures, um, the, this here um, indicates that this very thin films have um, lost their ferromagnetic properties and have, 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 have undergone a thickness dependent transition from being ferromagnetic to being um, paramagnetic. Um, but we're not the first to find this. This has been known since the late, nine, uh, well, early 2000s and um, late um, 90s, where um, groups have grown these films and measured the transport and magnetization as a function of thickness. And so for very, very for thick films, 13 unit cells and thicker, um, it's clear that these materials have a metallic ground state. And if you look at the magnetization of these samples, they also very, um, have very large magnetic moments with transitions very close to the um, But when you measure the transport of films, so for example, an 8-unit cell below 10-unit uh, cells, you see that the films have 
and its latent ground state. And as you decrease the thickness, the resistivity goes up and the magnetization goes down. So this um, indicates that in this material, you have this very strong um, thickness dependent change in the transport and magnetization. And so what we'd like to do is um, try and figure out if there's some change in the structure of these films due to the, um, as a function of thickness. And uh, what we want to do is also look at the effect of polari the polarity of these films on the uh, crystal structure and try and relate that to the mag magnetic um, transitions in the system. And so LSMO in the ionic limit is also a polar material uh, in that you have uh, for 30% um, strontium doping, you have these alternating plus minus 0.7 charges. And so here you have a polar interface and a polar surface. And um, to, find, to determine the structures of these systems, we take them over to the synchrotron. And um, for these measurements, we perform them at the advanced photon source at the Argonne National Lab. And the technique we use is one where we measure um, in three dimensions the diffraction uh, intensities, where we are sampling the, um, along what are known as crystal truncation rods in three dimensions. And the, this technique allows us to um, determine the phases associated with all of these intensities uh, using a technique called the coherent Bragwood analysis. And then we can take an inverse Fourier transform of the diffraction data in three dimensions into a real space uh, four-dimensional structure where we can tell in every single layer of the film the composition and the position with sub angstrom resolution. And so what we find for the LSMO um, film, so this is a 10 unit cell film, is that at the very surface of the film, um, in this film, which are manganese oxide terminated, um, the manganese ions here are displaced upwards away from the interface related to the oxygen sublattice. And if you go down to the lanthanum uh, lanthanum oxide layer below, you can also see that the Lanthanum strontium ions also displaced are force related to oxygens. And we can plot this delta, that is the, the difference in the z positions as a function of um, the distance from the interface with the SDO. And you can see that these distortions um, are large at the surface, but decay with the decay length proportional on, on the order of about four unit cells um, thickness of these films. And uh, these distortions also occur at the interface uh, between the LSMO and the STO. And um, the reason we think this is good. This is going to affect magnetization, for instance, is that when you have these polar distortions, you're essentially moving the oxygens up related or down, in this case, related to the manganese ions. And you're reducing the increase, uh, decreasing the bond angle between the manganese oxygen and the next manganese away from the optimum, which is around 165 degrees, and effectively reducing the super exchange um, interactions, which will cause this material to be ferromagnetic. So the Summary of that is that um, we think that due to these surface relaxations and the interface relaxations driven by the polarity of the LSMO, you end up with films where, for whatever thickness you grow, the top two to three unit cells are going to have these structural distortions away from bulk. If you grow it on a non polar substrate like STO, you're also going to get about two units of the interface which are distorted. And for ultra thin films where the entire thickness is um, dominated by these distortions, you end up with a paramagnetic um, insulating ground state. All right, so the obvious question then is, can we fix this interface to recover the bulk-like structure? And so what I'm showing here is a two-unit cell thick film where we find no magnetization. And I should point out that there have been quite a few attempts to modify the interfaces of LSMO to get bulk-like structures. But in many cases, um, they end up with um, critical thicknesses, which are still on the order of three to four unit cells of these systems. And so the simple trick we're going to play here is that we're going to add a layer on the top and the bottom here with the same um, charge stacking as LSMO, in, the, in this case, plus or minus 0.7. And so we're going to do this with a material where we're going to maintain the same A site um, as lanthanum and strontium. And um, the B site we're going to use here, is the X is going to be chromium. And the reason we're choosing chromium um, has to do with the fact that the chromate, lanthanum strontium chromate is antiferromagnetic in bulk, so we don't expect it to contribute to the magnetization. It has the same lattice distortion at the LSMO, so we don't expect any structural distortions at the interface induced by the structure of the LSCO. And um, what we also find is that the, all right, I'll speed up. Um, one issue with using things like ion as the transition metal ion is that you end up with a very large charge transfer from the ion to the manganese, which also drops the LSMO away from what you think um, it should be. And so in this case, we find that, that chromium works very well because it's a press this um, interfacial charge transfer. All right, so for two unit cells of LSMO by itself, there is no magnetization. When we add the chromate to the top and bottom interface, we see from speed measurements that there's a finite magnetization, which implies that um, by inserting these uh, phasal layers here, we've been able to 
engineer ferromagnetism back into this system. And um, we, can, we can change the LSMO thickness and keep it the chromate spatial layer thickness of three unit cells. And we find that the net magnet magnetization goes up with the LSMO thickness and the TC also goes up to room temperature as we increase the LSMO in this case. All right, and so we took the samples back to the synchrotron to just make sure that we're indeed removing these um, ferrodistortive um, instabilities. And uh, for a four year cell thick LSMO on STO, we find out that the films have, have these very strong polar distortions. And one and can, and can put LSU on both sides of the LSMO film. So these regions here are the manganite, manganese oxygen planes. The distortions go to zero, and the distortions are now concentrated at the LSEO, which is at the top surface of these films. All right, and so we also wanted to verify that indeed uh, the magnetization we're measuring is not coming from the chromate but, uh, alone, but coming from manganese layers. And um, I don't have time to go into the technique, but we're using a technique called X-ray magnetic circular dichroism, where we apply a, a film in plane uh, to the sample, and we measure with circularly polarized light the absorption at the manganese L edge. And at the, at the magnese L edge, we find out that um, there's a positive dichroic uh, signal, which implies that the spins in the LSMO are aligned with the field as we expect. Um, but um, the chromate we can bulk is uh, anti ferromagnetic. Um, we found we expected a zero signal, but we found out that there was a negative XMCD signal, which implies that the chromate spins are anti aligned with the applied magnetic field. And so, what this implies is that there's some anti ferromagnetic exchange at the interface between the manganese and the chromium which is causing the chromate spins to be anti-aligned with the field. We can do a temperature dependence of this XMC the signal at the chromium and the manganese edge, and they follow the same dependence as we expect, as we find in these grid measurements. And this is representative of this sample here. But more importantly, we see that at the manganese edge, the moments don't go to zero even when we go up to room temperature, which implies that um, there's still some ferromagnetism in the system at room temperature. All right, and so to try explain why we have this um, thickness dependence in the net moments. And since we know that there's some contribution from the chromate, what we wanted to do now was um, gross superlattices of these samples where we can um, more reliably extract the chrom chromium moment and the manganese moment. And this is a TEM just showing that we can go in this field to very good um, crystal and structural order. And by assuming that the total magnetization in these grid measurements was coming from the negative chromium and the positive um, manganese layers. Um, we can now plot as a function of the ratio of the chromate and manganese thickness, the squid magnetization. And this is a very simple line here, which whose um, grip slope here is negative, and that represents the chromium um, magnetic moment, which we know have to be negative from the XMC, XMCD measurements. And the intercept here tells us the manganese moment, which we find here is very close to what we expect for ball. So we, we are very confident that what we are seeing here is a total recovery of the bulk-like moments in the manganese. And the squared measurements here imply that the energy scales for these um, transitions here are set by the combination of the interactions between these two layers. All right, and so we can explain the anti-ferromagnetic interaction here by uh, simply considering the um, interactions across the interface, which we expect to be anti-ferromagnetic because in the case of going on STO, we are applying tensile strain to the system where the x, x minus y square orbitals, which point in plane, have lower energies. And so in plane here, you have the coupling between the half field manganese um, orbital here and the un unoccupied orbital here, which should be ferromagnetic. And then out of plane direction, um, because you are coupling these two orbitals here, which are un unoccupied, the good enough Kanamori rules um, tell you that you should have anti ferromagnetic in, um, exchange across this interface. All right, so just um, in one minute, we've been playing games now by trying to change the strain to change these orbital um, um, polarizations. We can go to these films even on LAO where we have about 2% compressive strain and still maintain good um, epitaxy. And um, what we find is that um, independent of the strain we apply for the very thin um, LSMO films, we still have a ferromagnetic ground state. Um, but what we find is that as we increase the LSMO thickness, there's a, a difference now, a, a much more significant difference in the magnetization going from LSAT where the strain is very close to zero um, to LSMO where we have very large um, tensor um, compressive strain um, on the system. And uh, so what DFT helps us to do is determine what the ground state system uh, of these systems, magnetic state of these systems should be. And um, what we find is that the lowest ground state is what we see experimentally where you have the LSMO spins ferromagnetic in, um, inside that layer. The LSEO LSO spins also ferromagnetic, but the coupling between these two layers here 
with anti-ferromagnetic. Uh, very close in energy is a state where all the layers are ferromagnetic. And what we like to do in the future is try and find ways by which we can dynamically go between these two states to change the um, magnetization in the system. All right, um, so I, I, we can also do measurements to determine what the orbital polarization is in the system. And we do see this progression from um, the x squared minus y squared orbitrin on STO um, to the d squared minus r squared orbital orbitrin on LAO. And um, we can now correlate this um, reduction in the moments here with the fact that um, there is some um, correlation between what the spin ordering is in that system and what the orbital ordering is. And so for LAO, where we have compressive strain, we expect there to be anti um interactions in, plane, in the plane of the film, which explains why we should have this uh, reduced magnetization for the films which are grown on LAO. All right, I think I've run out of time. So I'll just conclude saying that we're able to demonstrate that we can tune these interactions um, very, um, in, in these films here. And um, as far as modeling is concerned, in this case, we have uh, a J in plane and a J out of plane, which we can, we can also tune um, dynamically by tuning the relative thicknesses of these films. We can also tune the doping of the relative doping of the quantum and strontium in each of these layers here, which gives us another parameter to also try and understand how the, uh, to, to, to create toy models for trying to understand these magnetic interactions in these systems. All right, so with that, I will take any questions. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, I, I probably missed something. You showed a slide where you looked at the distortion from the bulk structure as a function of distance from the nucleus. Yes, so that's where thin film on, on a substrate. Right, but it looked like as you got farther from the interface, the distortion was greater. Did I see that correctly? Okay. Could you repeat the question, please? So the question is, um, he's asking whether the distortions were greater going from the interface. All right, I'll go to that slide. This one? Yeah. Okay. So, so zero here is the interface with the STO substrate. And um, the surface here has these distortions because you have a field, an electric field at the surface. So th th there is some effect on the surface due to the fact that it's negatively charged, which causes the positive ions to move up and the negative ions to move down to form a dipole to cancel out the surface electric field. And then at the interface here, the distortions are smaller. You expect them to be similar in magnitude. But I didn't mention that at the interface here, we do have strontium lanthanum intermixing here, which reduces that. So the bulk crystal that would go back to you. Yes, yeah, so, so that, that's what we see here. In, in the bulk, yeah, we're from the interfaces, the distortions are as, as zero. Okay. Karen? So uh, going to the uh, la one of the last slides you showed where the, the energetic, energetically favored uh, anti aligned yes. moments compared to aligned layers uh, in the system. Do you, uh, I, think, I think maybe you said this and it went by too fast. Do you understand that as being you know, due to interactions at the interface or I mean, where, does, where, where do you understand that energy difference between those two states as coming from? Okay, so I think that- Yeah, yeah this one. Could you repeat? So, All right, so the question is- yeah, between A and B. Do we understand why there are differences in the energy between A and B? What's your, it, 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 you said it just, it, 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 it. all right, um, no, I, I didn't say it. I just said we, we, we found out they were close. Um, so at this point, we don't understand it fully. So we know that um, there is some charge transfer when you have compressive strain, which we don't see for the stuff on STO. Um, and so in the case of STO, this energy difference is much bigger, but in the case of the LSEO and LSMO, this is much smaller. So what I'll have expected just from the good enough Kanamori rules was that this would have been the ground state when we had compressive strain, because you are lowering the energy of the x squared minus y squared, the, the, the orbitals pointing out of plane. And so the coupling between manganese and chromium, I'll have expected just from those naive, naive um, predictions to be ferromagnetic. And so I, I think there's some competition between the, in, the Yeah, just, just the, the, the magnetic inter interactions in thin and out of plane, which puts these two very close in energy. Have you done any measurements in 
Um, yeah, so what we found now is that for the ultra thin, at the, in the, for four unit cells, there is a very weak metal um, insulator to metal transition at low temperatures. In the case of 2,2, we, we see a kink in the resistivity, but the resistance still goes up. And we're not sure now if it's just due to the reduced dimensionality, which is reducing the bandwidth and keeping the charge localized, or if it's due to some, something like charge ordering, which is um, coming into, into play in the system. Um, the DFT right now doesn't give us any indication of whether we should have a metal or insulating ground state. It, it still says it should be a metal. And we'll have to do things like DMFT now to try and really tease out what the true, true transport uh, electronic ground state of the system should be. So I have a question as well. Uh, some MBE folks, especially those who want to grow semiconductors and have good mobility, worry a lot about dislocations. Um, is there a reason for you to be worried about dislocations at all in this system? Would you see them if they were there? Um, <clears throat> all right, so we've grown bad films where we've seen dislocations, but from TEMs in these films here, we see uh, very few um, dislocations. Uh, when we grow it on MGO, whether the strain is, um, I think 45% there, the film relaxes and we do see uh, um, strong evidence for dislocations. Um, but in, in this case, so that should affect transport. Yeah. All right. thank you. Well, if there are no other questions, let us thank our speaker once again. Thank you.